We're back for bench racing. And again, we listened to you, the fans. You said that you wanted stock car promoters on here. I'm a man of the people. I can, I can deliver. I'm here now with the promoter of Sunset International Speedway. We got a ton to talk about. None other than Mark Dilley for his first ever appearance here on bench racing. And Mark, I mean, there's so much that I want to talk, talk about. And we got the schedule coming up for 2014 to Sunset, which is going to be huge. And lots of changes at the Speedway. Your NCATS deal. But I want to go way back here. We'll go back to your 14 when you started yeah. racing. So let's go back there. Tell me about you breaking into the sport because I mean you you were the Caden Lapsovich of your day. You were you were this kid racing against grown men. I mean no one had seen something like that in Ontario. Someone so young racing late models and super late models. Take me way back to how you got into the sport. Uh, really I just uh, I raced carts for a long time. Um, you know we had to, we got in the dirt bike phase and then we got into to go karts I guess from when I was about seven. And ran go karts up to 12, about five years. I actually did some stuff with Team Canada and that, and some different things with that. And then uh, wanted to get into stock car racing. Went to Sunset Speedway, a guy in my town where I grew up, Unionville, raced there. I went there, uh, watched it, uh, thought it was really cool. Um, so I, I actually bought a car. The first car I bought was off a guy named Rob Hinks, which I see him at the Speedway. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, it was a six-cylinder car from Barry, and uh, I bought the car. Uh, Rob was kind enough to give me the car without paying anything for it because I hadn't told my dad yet what I was doing. This was, I guess, I was 13 when I did that. Uh, and going into the season of 1983, I thought, I, I, as we got closer, where I had the guys that I had originally gone to the Speedway with, they, uh, Jim Cuthbertson and Barry Cuthbertson, they were helping me get this car ready, and. It began. I eventually, obviously, I had to tell my dad what what my plan was, and he was, you know, it had it had some interesting moments to say the <laughs> least. So, anyways, getting getting it done, and and you know, we we went to the racetrack. I had never driven a standard, never driven really a car, nothing like that, and I I never forget. I you know, I went right to, out there, and I couldn't believe how fast it got there to the corner, you know, uh, over a go kart or anything like that, and. And that's really where it began. I, I raced uh, super stocks at that time it was called, and uh, yeah, away we went. And uh, go, you know, then getting into it's pretty funny as you get into the, the '84, 1984, '85. You know, Kerry and I raced against each other, and and uh, I think I'm not sure we started in '85 or '84, raiding around there, and Johnny Gaunt and uh, Rick Farns, and I mean, just a whole bunch of bunch of guys that some of them still are, are active in racing and. And some of us, uh, some of them aren't. But yeah, it was there wasn't many there wasn't many 14 year olds then. It was uh, it was kind of you know unheard of and, and a little gun shy. I guess everybody was. Now, obviously, your father had a huge influence when you get started with the with the dirt bikes and the go karts. Did, did he come from a, a racing background? Or are you a first generation uh, race aficionado? No, my grandpa <laughs> my grandpa raced. My grandpa was actually uh, the British sports car world champion. And I think it was 59 and 60, and then he won a bunch of different British touring championships and stuff like that. Um, took a run at, I'm not going to say an Indy car, it was, it was, I can't remember the name of it, but it did run at Indianapolis with it. Um, so racing, and he did a lot of rally racing, hill climbing, which they don't have, I don't think anymore, but they used to go up hills in these cars, and it was, uh, so racing was in the family blood, so to speak. Um, so I, when my brother and I were growing up, my dad, you know, he for us to go. We would go dirt biking and go karting and and I read race carts and you know he he dedicated a lot of time uh, into us wrecking stuff, so to speak. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're competing at the at the regional level, at the weekly level. How long before you ended up going national? Which I guess back then would have been the Cascar Super Series. Yeah, was it, was I, it a lar large gap? I raced at Sunset <clears throat> for. Uh, 83, I think it was 83, 84, 85, and 86, then went super late model racing in 87, 88, and 89, and then the Cascar in, in uh, 1990 when they went to the c and &E. and and really we were just trying to find somewhere, I loved the super late models, I raced all over Ottawa, I went Ottawa, I went to the state, I went all over the place with it, uh, and back then there wasn't really uh, a lot of rules, they looked very, my car actually looked very similar to the car, the Oscar car of today, uh, just with a lot, they, we had aluminum motors and an 800 horsepower, and it was pretty, pretty crazy stuff. But a lot of fun. But really needed to find somewhere that we didn't have a lot of money, and I pretty well burned everything I was working 
I had a, I was doing my apprenticeship in graphic arts. I was making good money, but I was, you know, spending good money also. So, uh, you know, and I thought when when Cascar moved to the C and E, that was a way to get out there and you know, in an advertising and marketing base of right in the heart of Toronto, and, da, 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 and that's really where it took off from from there as far as on that side of it. But that's kind of the switch. It wasn't because I didn't like Super League model racing. It was just I needed someone else to pay for it. So you you've been with the national tour. Uninterrupted from 1990 to, to present day. Uh, 19. No, I in 1990. I won the championship in '94, the national championship. Uh, started the season in '95. Had some issues with uh, some stuff that that was going on. Um, left there, went to the states to race. I, I actually in the winter of between '94 and '95, I was in Florida. I'd, I'd been asked to come and race a Super Late Model car there, and I did. And we had great success in that. So then. In '95, we started the season. Um, I bought my own team again. I raced for Peter Shatanis up until '95, and then uh, I bought my own team. And really, it just uh, it, it went back. I, I went back. I actually came, brought the U.S. car here, and ran some Flexmore Super League model stuff with it. And then I went back to the states and ran in Florida and ran some stuff in Alabama and a bit in Georgia and stuff like that. And, and that really continued on into 96, 97, I ran a bit, 98, I didn't run a whole lot, I ran a couple of Super Late Model races, and then 99, getting back into, I went back into the cast car from 99, so I didn't, I, there was a year there that we were just trying to figure out where we were going to go, you know. So if you, you raced in, in Central Florida then in the mid-90s, where, whereabouts? I, I raced all over, I raced a, four, a series there, it was called Florida Pro. That, that one we raced down there, so we ran. I lived right, right from Sunshine Speedway. I could basically hit with a golf ball, so I ran a lot of Sunshine, uh, Bradenton, New Smyrna, Punta Gorda, Punta Central Gorda, County. Central yeah. County. Yeah. So oh. if I'm thinking mid '90s Central Florida, you were racing against Pete Orr, Dave Rogers, yeah. Derek Cole, Dave Pletcher, yeah. Dave Pletcher, Buggy Pletcher, Buggy son, Fletcher Dave Jr., um, Jimmy Cope. Jimmy Cope, that's what yeah, Jimmy yeah. Cope. Mike's Mike's brother yes. raced against him. Mike Franklin. Um, there was there was a bunch there was a bunch of guys that that we ran with, and you know actually it's funny uh, Zardo, which we know well. He was living down there. He he crew chiefed at one time for us at Thunder Gordon. Tom Milligan <laughs> helped me a lot down there. So stuff, at so. that point, were you racing for a living or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so what what would an average person the mid '90s super late model scene down in Florida? Uh, what would that offer you? Uh, Money wise. Win? I think we got, I got, uh, if I remember correct, it was about $600 to race and 30% of the purse. And I think at that time it might have paid, to, I don't know, a couple grand to, to win. So basically you win $1,200 a week if you're, if you're, if right. you're winning, if you won the race. I mean, I, and we won, uh, we won two uh, main ones down there, so that was good. And then, uh, but I mean, we always ran, we were always in the top, you know, five, six up in there. We ran third a couple times. So it was, I mean, I wasn't getting rich. But I still had, uh, when we first went there, I still had Sega. Uh, I had Sega as a sponsor, and Sega was definitely helping me out to go there and, and to push on and, and that. And, and NTN Bearings came on board, which I raced for them in the late 80s and then back in and stuff like that. So That's a phenomenal segue to my next question, because the one thing you've, you've always been known for, more so than your, your, your driving talent or what you've been able to do as a promoter, is, is how you've been able to market yourself. And and all you've been able to get some phenomenal sponsors that have stuck with you for long periods of time. Your Sega car up here might be what might be the most famous car you've ever had. It's a lot of people talk about it, bright yellow with the Sega down the side of it. How did that partnership start? That you were able to get a, a video game company to come on board with a with a regional racing super late model. Actually, it's it's a funny story how it did. Is uh, that was in nineteen when it originally came was in ninety three, and nineteen ninety two Carrie and I. Not, not a lot of people know this, decided that Kerry was looking for sponsorship and everything else. I think his Murphy's deal had been, his was done, didn't have anything. Um, I had NTN Bearings at, in 92 and had an offer from another video, from a video game company to buy out my contract at NTN Bearings and it was a lot more money. Not that NTN, NTN was great. So I came up with the idea that I would take NTN Bearings, put it on Kerry Mix's car, I would take this video game company, which was a company called Comerica Games, which was a thing called Game Genie. It was a thing that you put, I don't even know. All was great. We teamed up with Peter Shatanis. We had two-car team, Carrie and myself, and away we go. 
uh, that company defunct. So basically, Kerry had NTN and I had nothing. And I was uh, knocking on, I'll never forget it, they didn't pay me, we had run two races, we were going to Ottawa that weekend, it happened on the Wednesday, uh, the guy said, uh, we're done, we're not paying any of the bill, we're closing this, whatever was happening, um, and I was beside myself, and I actually walked in the front door of Sega, which was in Richmond Hill, and the guy, a guy walked, the lady was there, a guy walked out, and uh, started, his name was Jeff McCarthy. He, uh, he started talking to me. I just, I asked who the marketing manager was and he said, oh, that's, that's me. And uh, I explained to him that I raced for Comerica Games. This had happened and, uh, you know, we'd lost out. And, and uh, he said, well, I'm gonna be honest with you. He, he actually was the president of Sega. He said, that's kind of my fault. And I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> they said, well, we, pound, we put so much pressure on that because it was an adapter going into a Sega game or a, or a Nintendo I think it was at that time that made the games do things that we basically pushed that company out um, so I'll take the contract yeah because what Game Genie was and I was I was a bit of a nerd when I was younger it's it's you were able to put in different codes and the Game Genie would sort of unlock the game for you without you ever having to play it so I, I can see why Sega would they, would start they, they basically gone. crushed the company. I guess is I mean, you know I don't know if that's exactly how it went down, but I know all I know is I wasn't getting any money. Uh, <laughs> Sega came on and they said that uh, uh, just I don't, I don't know why I drove in there, but there was just something in my head, and then they picked up the con, and I had a great relationship. They were they're amazing people to deal with. I had great times, fun. Uh, they were a great company along with NTN. NTN I raced for I think a total of 13 years over in and outs and and ups and downs, but usually I had, even when Peter had it, that was my deal, I get to Peter, and you know, we were always involved uh, somehow with it, and again, great, great people there. How would you compare what the racing landscape was, you know, in Ontario when you were racing super late models at a weekly level to the way it is right now, because I mean, we're hurting right now in Ontario. I mean, I, I think they're hurting pretty much everywhere in North America, but especially here in Ontario, we're starting to, we're feeling it at every level, in every division, at every track, how would you compare the landscape to where it was in the, in the early 90s? Now, racing in general, you're right, is hurting, right? and it doesn't matter if it's cup or what it is. It's uh, the problem with any racing is usually 98% of racing is expendable money, whether it's a fan, whether it's a racer, or whatever. The biggest thing that have changed is the cost to do everything is so much money now, and it's whether it's a racer, whether it's a speedway operator, whether whatever it is, where the input or the money coming in is not even close to the justification of the of how high it's gone up. And it's just, you know, it's not like a, you know, you look at the housing market. I mean, when I moved to Barry, houses were 150 grand. You know, that same house today is $380,000. Um, you know, that's basically how the costing of racing has gone up and, and operations. The problem is, is the income part of it is still at $180,000. It's never grown to where it is and and that's just it's the realization of people only have so much money and 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 same as the racers i mean it, it's tough it's tough stuff. look at the price of fuel insurance for trucks trailers i mean these guys are, are towing all over the place and they, you know and it's scary if you add if you if you sat down that up same as speedway operators all of them it doesn't matter if it's sunset very i mean the, the people that own these places are, are out on a limb like no, not I'm not saying they don't have money and whatever like Rick and Diane they get your money and the guys that don't but it's so hard it's such a fine line to make money that and, and that's what the you know the general person in 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 racing doesn't understand it's it's you know the thing with these things they're not a max milk you don't close it mop the floor open the next morning flip the lights on this these things the maintenance that goes on during the week of these places and and the cost and the expenditures are, are huge and that's that stuff's gone so high in comparison of what they what they bring in. I mean, if I were to sit a group of racers down, if you get 40 racers in a room and ask them how many of them want to be a promoter, I don't think a single hand would go up. I mean, most guys that I talk to, they say, well, you know, when I'm out of racing, maybe I'll be a driver coach, or maybe, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that, but I never want to be a promoter. You stepped up more than once now and, and held that role. I mean, <laughs> How did that all get started? What what sort of drove you to not only not only are you a promoter, but you're a driver at the same time? You wear a lot of different caps. How did that all get started for you? Really, um, how it started was I lived in Markham Unionville, 
and I bought a house up here in 90, it was 99 moving in, in in March of, sorry, 98 moving in in March of 99, we bought the house. Um, worked with Brad, and I don't know, Brad Moran, everybody knows, I don't know, Brad and I have been friends since 1989. Brad and I worked together since 89 all the way up through. I, I, at that time I was working for Brad and Joe, but couldn't afford to buy a house down there. Uh, so had a new raise contract, I thought, you know what, this is a time that I can buy a house. Uh, came up one day, was just driving, and there was a little restaurant at the, the end of the road where Barry Speedway is called Shambles. Went in there for a milkshake, I forget where we were going to, and uh, uh, Nigel Squirrel and Gord Coach were sitting there. And I, you know, I, I knew Gord a little bit, but not not great, and, and somehow we just started, I didn't know Nigel at all, somehow we started talking, and they had said they bought the Speedway. I think I knew they had bought the Speedway, I think I said, congratulations, that's great, you know, going to redo it, and, and so on. And then he, he, you know, Gordon, is Gord's way, he said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'd explain that I just bought a house and I had a race thing. And, you know, Gord said, yeah, well, you can't live off racing. And, and I said, well, you know, I got to get something going on. I don't know what I was going to happen. And, and they, they actually made me, he told me to come the next day. That was actually on a Sunday afternoon, I think. And then Monday morning, I went and met with Gord and, and Nigel. And, and they put a thing together for me to be, you know, do the marketing and the promoting and, and help with that. And that's really how it began. I mean, and you know, I didn't. I just wanted to do it. I, re I really, really wanted to do it, and that's how it, how that started in that that era of '99 when Gordy did the track, and and away we went. I mean, late '90s, early 2000s. Like I was, I was a Sunset guy. I grew up in Sunset, but we always heard about what Barry was doing. Now, I, my parents hate racing. They would just they would drop me off at Sunset. And that was I was lucky to go to Sunset. They dropped me off at the highway and picked me up at 11 o'clock. They had want nothing to do with it. So I never got to go to Barry until I got my license, which I guess was after you were out of there but we always heard about everything that Mark Dilley was doing at Barry and everything Barry had going on so what were what were some of the innovations that you sort of just ran with up at Barry that they really sort of turned that track around in the late 90s really I think the biggest thing was you know as we came in it was fresh you know we did go there we'd redone the asphalt and, and done some things like that just tried to look at it I mean these are businesses but tried to look at it where the bottom line is and I don't care I can I've said it a million times Without racetracks, there's no drivers. Without drivers, there's no racetracks. Without racetracks, there's no drivers. So the reality is, is it's a marriage. Uh, it's not going to be great all the time. It isn't. People get mad. People, but you need to. Everybody needs to look at it from both sides of the fence, right? The racers. It's hard for racers to understand, you know, the business side of how much these people have invested in these racetracks. And I, like I said, it doesn't matter what racetrack it is. The people that own these tracks have a lot of money invested in time, and you know if they give you they got a dollar for the every hour they put in the thing, they they might have a chance of getting some return, but it just doesn't happen. So um, that that was I just tried to look at it from a little bit of a different angle on it, and, and you know listen to what the racer said, tried to take what I had learned, and, and it was a whole learning curve for myself. Also, Gord helped me, you know, a lot of different ways. Gord had, had Gord Coates had had Sunset Speedway. In the early 70s, so he had he had you know he he wasn't brand new to it and a very smart man and, and Nigel and just I learned a ton like through Gord and, and through uh, through Nigel and, and it was I mean great a great life experience to, to do that and to get to where we are. Now, how many years were you at Barry? And for the whole time you were there, was it it was strictly at, in the role of, a, of of promoter? No, I was at Barry for till I'm probably gonna mess it up a bit. I think till 2001, and then kind of. I, I, racing was getting bigger and it was kind of, you know, everybody was kind of doing, doing their own things. And then I, I can't remember exactly how it all went down. So, but I think Brad, when Brad ended up getting involved, he was moving up here. He bought out, um, Brad bought out Gord originally. And then I went up to see Brad at the Speedway. I got excited. Then I bought out Nigel. Okay. Then... And that was 2000, I think 2002, again, in and around there. We owned it together for a couple of seasons, Brad and I did. Then Gord actually bought me back in. So Brad and Gord owned it. And, you know, I, that was a situation for me. I was trying to continue racing, um, and I just didn't have enough money to, you know, I realized that, you know, it's the same thing as I said before, what people don't see. I mean, I remember one time Brad and I, we made 
I got to just throw some numbers. We made three thousand dollars. We were all you know pumped up and it was good and things were starting to roll. And we're talking about it, and then the next night some guy smashed right through the wall. And I think it cost us 8000 to fix the wall. So those are the things that people don't see. Fences being fixed, washing, canteen, everything you can think of. That, and, and I just did not have the bankroll to do that. So I, I, uh, I opted to get out, and, and Brad and them made it very successful to, what, you know, to where it is today. Brad and Gordon and Steve St. Ange, and I don't know how many different hands went in and out, but... but uh, no, that's really how it happened. Now, when, when, you, when you left Barry, when you got bought out, did you sort of feel as though there was a lot that you hadn't accomplished yet as a promoter and that sort of led you to way down the line and up at sunset? Or what, what brought you back to this side of the game? <laughs> I was I was tired when when I left Barry I was tired you know lots of things were happening race wise everything else and and uh, so I didn't you know I thought okay I did the best I could do and you know we did a good job we got to where it was but it was a lot of time you know and then we were spending a lot of time and I, I wanted to spend more time on the race and that's really so I didn't I didn't really say that okay I'd accomplish something because I really didn't accomplish what I what I wanted to and, and I don't think we ever do and I always want to accomplish more and more but. Um, I got a call one day from a guy I knew. Um, I was sitting on there. I was sitting up down, and the, the call come in. And, and yeah, hello, yeah, hi, how are you? And he says his name. And he says, uh, yeah, I bought a racetrack. I started laughing. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I want you to come down and talk to me about. It. I said, why would I want to do that? <laughs> That's my exact words. And they're, you know, nice guy. And I said, you know what? I'll come down, you know, what track did you buy? He said, you bought Sunset. And at, at that time, I hadn't been to Sunset Speedway much in the, over the last, I'm going to say, six, seven years, you know. I went there one time to run a pro challenge car, and that was about it. And I remember there was dust and dirt, and I did the, I mean, I just, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't, not that I don't like dust and dirt and all that, I just thought, you know what, it's, I didn't really know. I knew Steve was out of it. I didn't, I didn't know the Lloyd's that good or whoever owned it at that time. And, I just didn't think it was going anywhere. I didn't never heard nothing about yeah. it. So, so I never really went there. Um, went and had the meeting. So I, basically, they asked me if I would if I would do be the promoter. Uh, I said no, <laughs> not even remotely. Um, then I was driving home and I was thinking about it. And I thought, you know what? Uh, you know, I, I called them back. I said, listen. I said, I, you know, the biggest problem with racetracks is. We buy them like if Mark Dilly was to buy them. I don't have the money to make the upgrades that it needs. Will you guarantee me? You know, if I'm going to do this, we're going to do it right. We're not going to be half pregnant. Will you guarantee me the money to make the changes we need to make? And there was at that time there was ten guys involved. They said come back down. We'll have another meeting. So I went back down. Um, had another meeting with them. They said that they would. Uh, they wanted to buy this, have some fun with it. So you know, they were they were a nice bunch of guys. I said, yeah, okay, I'm gonna do it. And that's kind of really, you know, and then this was I'm gonna say this was, jeez, uh, it, it it had to be. It was April. close to opening it was night. April. You didn't have a whole lot of time. Yeah, to... it was it was it was April by the time. I think like I think that first initial meeting was right at the end of mid April. I'm gonna say I think it was maybe three weeks before. That we had a we had a conversation that this place is supposed to open, so uh, we did that, put that together. First thing I knew I was still racing. Um, Steve and I have been friends a long time. I uh, I went. Steve was uh, really working at Part Source at that time, and you know working doing whatever. I had. I hadn't talked to him in a long time. I seen him one day, and so first thing I did is I uh, really I wasn't going to do it unless you know I had Steve to. To come with me, I, and that was one of the steps because I knew he knew how to turn the lights on. He knew where, he knew where everything was, and and, and and you know, he loved it. He he his passion for for, and I I will have to go still go racing and, and whatever the case may be. So, he was you know the main piece of getting that that part of it uh, put put into place, and and then we did, and and <laughs> there we, we got the keys. I, I'm trying to say, I'm thinking it opened May 10th, the May 9th. Was the Friday we got the keys for the speedway? I'll never forget it. 5:45 that night, and it was go time the next day. So that's how how close it was. And then you know, the first year we just kind of you know did a couple. You know, you've been through. You were with us. I mean, some changes here, some you know 
basically putting perfume on a pig, you know, I mean, we just paint it here and do whatever we could to clean up. But in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, uh, it needed what we did. I mean, and it's still, you know, I would love to say, go into phase three. Phase one was the racetrack. Phase two was getting the pit area better, the protection. Phase three is grandstands, tower, uh, washrooms and that. And, you know, we're just, when phase three will come, I don't know at this point, but I know, you know, phase one and two I'm happy with, so. It's just funny that you mentioned Steve Slaughter Sr. because that's that's a man that, having talked to him, I know that when he when he sold Sunset, he felt as though there was a lot left in the tank, that there was a lot more that he wanted to do that he wasn't able to because he was doing it all out of his own pocket. And I mean, for all the reasons yeah. that you've mentioned, it, it's impossible to do everything you want to do. So when he stepped away from the game, I know that there was a lot that he wanted to do. When you initially contacted him, did it take a lot of time for him to uh, to sort of no. agree to come back? No, he... He, you know, I called him and I, yeah, we laughed a little bit and I said, you ain't going to believe this one. So, and, <laughs> I mean, I still didn't believe that I was even having the conversation in general. I mean, you know, I kind of, I, I said I would do it and, you know, I, I really thought, and, and one of the reasons is, to be honest, that I, racing's been good to me. You know, you know, people say, I, I've made a living at racing in whatever form it's been for, for a long time. I'm not a millionaire by no means, but I've fed my kids and, and uh, you know, whatever the case would be. So I thought, you know what? These guys are doing this. Let's give this back. Like let's let's make a run. And that, and really that's kind of how. And I said to Steve, we had a meeting. I sit down. I said, I want to want to do this. I go. I want to. I want to. I'm pumped up. I want to. You know. I want this to be a great facility and somewhere to go. Because, and I don't care what it is. And I don't know where that speedway would be if those guys hadn't have bought it today. I don't Close think would be the answer. I I would have to agree with that. And. I would. I don't want to see speedways closed. We've had speedways closed the last couple of years around here. There's another one just closed at Western Canada. They're closing all over, um, and and I know why. It's not a you know this is a it, it, it. You can only throw money into a hole so long. And eventually, it's like I'm not doing this anymore. So, that's uh, and, and I mean you, you know I hear all all kinds of people say oh you know wouldn't you love to see Barry? No, I would hate to see Barry close. And that's the guy. I mean that. From the truth, I have a lot of heart and Barry. I've, you know, Brad and I worked hard at there, you know, and and everybody's carried on, and, and it's a great facility. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter what it is. Speedways closing aren't helping racing. So I think that's, and I, that, I knew that you could see that was coming in that I think in, in what was happening. So yeah, to say the least, Steve jumped in. Is it ever a strange marriage between you two, considering when you were at Barry trying to make a living owning the joint, he was down the highway at Sunset doing the same thing. I mean. No matter what anyone wants to say, there's a, there's a highway that separates the two tracks, but they're only 20 minutes apart. There, there is a certain rivalry. Yeah. You're almost drawing from the same population of we, fans, give or take. Is it ever weird working alongside we, of them? No, no, because, you know, when I first took the job at Barry, my job basically was to get cars. I mean, that's, I'm not going to lie. That was, I was hired in, let's get the cars, let's get, you know, you know that that was my job to do. And, and you know, we, we did it fairly well, not, not, not saying anything that, Steve didn't do a good job on his end. It just, you know, it was change, and people like change sometimes. So, uh, I always felt bad, but uh, I always did, and and I told Steve that, you know, even you know, it's just my job. Man. I got to do my job, you know. Um, so, we've talked about it many times, but I so I knew when they when they made this offer that I wanted to go. The first guy I would go to was Steve, because when when Brad and I owned uh, uh, Barry. We actually worked a lot with Steve back and forth. We 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 actually put the Sipco shootout. We had different Barry against uh, uh, Sunset cars, and then we had what they called the BPS, was the Barry Peterborough Sunset. We did a little thing. And we were we were actually making some ground on this. We were running it on Wednesday nights, and we were starting to build some crowds. And then it, it kind of whatever. When I left, it kind of I don't know what happened exactly, but. So, you know, we had done a business relationship and, and we were we were on good terms as far as that goes. So, it, it is, I want to talk about the, the, the renovation because that's just such a massive undertaking that it, it makes my head spin to try to think about if I was in the position to, to redesign a speedway and, and make it work. And when they came to you, the owners came to you and said, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's redo this. Let's give us a, a blank canvas. We're going to start all over, new track, how do we design it? They come to you. What, what do you do? Nah, basically, well, the first thing was they sent a survey crew in and we get all that. Um, really, they were. It started off as me trying to explain to a designer and that what I wanted, and it was like. But you know, remember, 
he didn't know a racetrack from anything. Like, I want this degree of banking here, and I want this, and I need, and it was going nowhere. It was absolutely going horribly. So, um, you know, I'd taken, you know, he, we'd taken stuff out the wall. I, we, did, we just, I started the process. I was digging stuff, and, and you know, and then I said, I really got to get a better plan of what we're doing here. So, um, I, I actually, I had the blueprints, and I was at, the, at my house, and I had the, on the coffee table, and uh, I didn't know how to figure this out. I wanted, you know, I said to my, the guy that uh, was living with me there, my buddy, he said, how do I find out? I want to find out degrees. I need to find out degrees of banking from this point to this point, how much I need to put in, so that would give me the elevation changes. Like, I'm no rocket scientist, but it was very easy to do on the program. He got me as far as for getting elevation changes of what we could do and, and getting grade in that. So I took this thing, and I actually used crayons of my kids <laughs> <laughs> and, and a plate, and we went at her. And I, I, and I went at this thing, and I worked all night. Because I said to the guy, I was getting frustrated, and I was down. It was right down in the city. I said to the guy what I wanted, and he kept saying that, no, you know, I, I didn't get it. And I said, I'm going to have this back to you by Monday morning. And that was on a Friday. And I, you know, I thought about it on, I worked all night, all night Saturday night, most of the day Sunday, and I had it back down there. And he, I don't know if he looked at it, and it, I mean, it had blue and purple and pink and colors, and, and he was looking at it, and I'd written the numbers in, like, I'm talking numbers, I bet you there was elevation numbers and nothing, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I have it somewhere, but I'll bet you there was 2,000 different numbers on it that I'd written it. And I gotta be honest, I had no idea if that was, I know what I wanted, and I think these were the right numbers, but it could have been 2,000 numbers, a waste of time. So he took it, he said, okay, I'm going to the back room, I'll throw it up. So he came out, he said, uh, he said, yeah, no, it's, it's, it'll work. And that's, and then he, then they gave me a proper blueprint off that. But that's, that's exactly how it went down. Yeah, it was, uh, and then the, the construction process was very long, uh, tough. I mean, it was, it was, we had some good weather, but it was long. It's tough to do. I mean, we were you're against because you want to try and open that. Uh, lucky I had my buddy Rob McCaddy uh, and some guys around here, Matt and his team. You know, they really took the bull by the horns. We first we had another company in from the city that one of the owners had known. And, and again, you have to understand if you've never seen a high banked racetrack or a banked race, you don't know what you're looking at. You don't know where Rob and raced with me, good friends. He's worked on a race team. He knew what we wanted and. And he was great with machinery, and that's how it got to where it is. Now, obviously, the, the track redesign is, is a lasting impression you've left on Sunset, that even if you were to leave tomorrow, you would always say, you know, I, this, is, this is me, I designed this. Two other things that you could always like claim to is one's the Velocity Weekend, and the other is the Sobble Speedway Home and Home. So the Velocity Weekend, I mean, I don't think there's a track in the province that hasn't tried a late-season mega event. You know, maybe not in recent memory, but I can't name one. A lot of them fail. It's not easy to do. You're competing against weather. It's not always easy to draw the fans or the cars. In a very short amount of time, you've been able to do all of that. You know, other than the weather, we've had some some off weather years, but the, the cars and the fans are always there. I mean, walk me through. Is this event what you always wanted it to be, or is there still more that you can do for the velocity? It, weekend? It's it's. I mean, you know, obviously you want to keep building and carrying on, but I mean, it's a strong. You know, I'm going to come out now. Now I got a new theory. <laughs> <laughs> I always said something. You know, velocity's good. People know it. You know, it's a good way of closing before you know before they go to Peter or whatever the case may be. Um, so it's kind of it's it's got a growth pattern. I think everyone has a good time. I mean, card counts are nuts and crazy, and it's 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 a great weekend as far as that goes. I'm gonna my first step into my next. I have a few new things I'm gonna do, but I, I want to start the year with a velocity. That's my my goal. Yeah, so. My first year, I have the Great Lakes, this year, Great Lakes Concrete Spring Derby, which is our class's invitational style, 100 lap or 50 lap. That I want to grow to a two day velocity. Come, you know, you come out, we dust your snow off you, and you know, this is where we're going to get at it, and, and we're going to come out swinging. And that, that I, will, I will build that, hopefully, to a velocity. I want to start with a velocity and end with them, you know, called. Spencer Spring Derby or the Great Leagues Conference the first day, you know. So I think that that show this year will be, I believe that show right out of the bucket will have, uh, I, I'm going to say we'll have 45, 40 to 45 late models 
there's a lot of racetracks not operating yet with the same class of car. Um, I think the first month will be like that. There's, you know, you don't have Peterborough's not open, Sobel doesn't open for one day and then they shut down for a bit with the Limas. So we're going to really push on that. I want to come out and I really would love to see a size of a velocity race as the start of, of uh, the year. And that's that by 2015, that's my goal. Now, the Sowell Sunset Home and Home, in the climate that we have now in Ontario, it, it's a rarity because a lot of promoters, it's almost like you guys are all holding a, a piece of fabric and everyone's tearing it one way and, and you can't seem to get two people to think the same. I mean, we got class rules are getting further and further apart. Guys are scheduling on top of one another. What Sunset and Sobel have done is sort of buck that trend and now we're, we're aligning rules, we're aligning schedules and it's, it's built into this, this series. How did that all start? Whose idea was that and, and how easy was it to get Sobel on board? Um, we, well, we talked about, I mean, we talked about it, I, we actually talked about it originally uh, uh, with uh, Rick and Diane about doing something. It's just hard. They, it's hard for them to do that because they have a different point structure with their NASCAR thing, and it's hard to flop in and flop out and that, and they need to have so many nights. So it, it really didn't fit their 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 MO, so to speak, where, where Jason and I have always talked back and forth about doing some different things, and, you know, he helped me with some things, and I helped him with some things and, and that, and then... Uh, I, I can't, I, I always wanted to do it, I thought, you know what, so we talked about getting our rules aligned, and uh, really, he, he, we, we got them real close to where they were, they weren't that far out as it was, but we talked about, you know, when, when we got involved with the, the new Superstar car and stuff like that, so really, it just we kind of together, and it, it's been good, I mean, it has, it's been good for both speedways, it's good for the racers, it's, it's, a, it's a good event, and I would, I would definitely keep it going. Now, you're not a very complacent guy. You're always wanting to, to grow things and, and push it farther. What's the growth pattern on something like this? Is it is it more events with Sobel? Is it maybe throwing another speedway into the mix, almost like what the BPS Rumble Series was? Where where do you think this could be headed in the next uh, two or three seasons? It has potential to grow. You know, I mean, I think as you know, as as JP builds up his his late model class and his Superstock Thunder Car Superstock class, as he builds that up, maybe there's room to get involved in that. Um, you know, it's just, I think there's real, but for right now, you know, it's enough for the guys to travel, you know, from our guys going up to Solvo and Solvo guys coming here, you know, that's again this year when the guys come to our place, um, I put an invitational on the next day. So the 26th, they're at home and home with us, and then there's an invitational on the 27th, because what that should do is that's going to help them with costing. You only have one toe. You know, you're welcome. They, they leave their stuff at their camp, whatever the case may be. You're saving, if someone's towing from the Salvo Beach area to here, they're probably saving $300 at least in fuel right off the bat. We'll run that show early on the Sunday. They can get out of there and we'll get them home. And, and you know, But I think the, the savings in it, it, it will, be, uh, will be a gain for us. Obviously, having guys travel, how is it from here? From here to Salvo is what, two hours, two, two and, and a half, half something hours, like that? Sure. So having guys travel up the road two and a half hours for a points-paying event, was a risky maneuver. Has the general feedback from drivers been been positive? It has. It has. It's you know. I mean, you know, we have a great bunch of race cars. You know, they, they 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 support. They've supported me in all kinds of things. I've made lots of mistakes, and you know, they've supported me through. And and, and that's that's amazing. You know, and the same as when we talk for this. Generally speaking, the racers understand that racing gets to be monotonous. It's the same repetitive thing week in week. So. This changes it up. It gives, you know, we can go up and showcase our product. They can come here and showcase their product, get to race at a different racetrack. It's got some, so, you know, it's got some jazz to it. And that, that's really what, uh, and that's, again, you know, schedule of this year. That's, we've changed a lot of things. Qualifying procedures are changing. Oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's changing. Race laps, I mean, not as many nights, more laps. Uh, so we're changing it. I mean, I mean, I'm going out in the limb, but we're changing it. Now, obviously, the, the more special events we throw, the more that puts on your plate, the, the more time it's going to require you to, to play the role of track promoter. You've still got the NASCAR Canadian Tire Series gig, but are, how long do you feel as though you'll be active as a driver? Do you feel as though that might be winding down in the in the near future? I don't, yeah, I mean, money is everything in that game. I mean, if the money's still there, we're going to keep going. Uh, the money dries up, i probably be done, you know, I would, I would probably get another a super late model car and go run a couple shows maybe in the states or whatever the case may be that would be you know but i mean as long as the money's there i'll still run we'll still run with carrie and i it, it's not the, the whole season it would have to be 
to, for me to go and commit to running everything, it's going to have to be a pretty good contract. Not that, not that we don't have good contracts now, but um, for me to take that much time away. So really the way Kerry and I do it, I, you know, I run the ovals, he runs the road courses. It works out pretty good. I think I only missed three races this year or something. So it's, it's not bad. It works out pretty good. So Now, okay, we got the 2014 schedule in front of us. This is the part that I want to save to the end because this is this is going to be the part that's going to get us a couple hundred views, bam, right off the hop. So we'll start small. Tell me about the lap changes. We got longer distance races every week, every week that we run. Yeah. Less weekly nights. I love that. There's a lot of tracks in, in the in the coastal region, North Carolina, <coughs> Tennessee, Virginia, that have employed that strategy for years. It works great for them. Tell me about the the new deal and and this new uh, what's the the super series that we have for 2014. Well, basically, we got a thing. We ran 18, 19 shows. Uh, typically every year since dirt was turned over and you know I thought I started thinking about it one day and you could see I could see the late model soft spring car and super stock car and the mini stock. these cars now are not built in backyards and you know not taking anything away what racing was coming back 15 years ago 18 years ago but you know these are fully fabricated cars and that's you know People say, well, yeah, well, that's the problem with racing. You cannot stop technology. It, it's gonna, it doesn't matter. It's, it, people will find it and move, and it, and it just grows. And that's the way it is. Uh, you know, if you look at, take a Corvette, 76, 1976 Corvette was a nice car. The 2014 one <laughs> is wicked. What comes next, we don't know, you know. So thinking about, I could see, uh, you know, I'm in the pits and I'm watching, and you could see people were tired. Yes. And, and you know, they were burned out. Guys, you know, doesn't matter who it was. You could see people were really, really tired. And, and uh, you know, I remember talking to Billy Z, Zardo there. He come through and I, I said, Billy, I mean, you know, you, you look wore out. And he said, he's killing me. He says, I, you know, there's so much maintenance on these cars. And I said, I, I agree. He says, every week, you know, I'm trying to get the car ready. I'm trying to get here. Trying... So I started thinking. I thought, okay, let's just do the math here on this. You know, I took, I used Billy as an example. For him to come from his place and go back home, He's two hundred dollars in fuel. Okay, so I thought, okay, if I cut five nights out, he's a thousand bucks in his pocket right off the bat. Okay, if I just in fuel, never mind the uh, the time during the week, but then the entry fees. No, no, it's it's probably about a two thousand dollars swing right off the bat. Not that you're going to say, oh, I'm up two thousand dollars now, but you know, in in a numbers game, that's basically where what what I figured out is so. How do I cut it back, give them more time to work on their cars? And the key thing now is some family time. You know, there's a lot of pressures in the world and a lot of things that people want to go away and you can't go away. When you race 22 nights, you ain't going away with your family. And that, you know, I, I'd done that. I raced every weekend and, and it would be nice to go away. If somebody wants to get married, you know, like I'm not saying they're going to do their marriage around our schedule, but. A lot of things, uh, you know, happen and, and that you can't go to. So now the way we've done it, uh, we've come up with the Super Series. They're 50 lap races. They pay more, a lot more money than the other races paid. Um, same kind of tire rule we had. So the tires, it stays the exact same in the tires. There's no more expenditure in tires. You're saving on how many times you go back and forth to the speedway. So your travel time is down. You also, like Canada Day weekend, they're off. There's two weeks that are back to back in a row in August that they're off, and nights in between that they're off. So, I mean, if someone wanted to go on holidays, you could go on holidays in July and in August. Not, you know, we're, we're going to close and, you know, we have a closed date in September. I don't expect people to go on holidays in September when school starts. So, there is opportunity there. And, and, you know, good dates right in the middle of the summer that if you wanted to go fishing with your kids or boating or parasailing or whatever you do, you have an opportunity to do that. So that was kind of, that's kind of my theory on it. Now, I know that the payout structure is sort of hanging in the balance right now. There's, there's a little bit of work to be done there to, to shore it all up. As it stands right now, if I'm, if I'm a winner of a late model event sunset, tell me what my, what's my pay envelope going to look like? What are the options heading into 2014? A hundred lap race will pay 1800. A 75 lap race pays 1500 to win and 15 or 16 I'm not sure I can't remember exactly uh, a 50 lap race pays 1300 to win a so regular night pays 1300 dollars to win that's huge we, we've got so so for the the Great Lakes concrete spring derby 100 lap feature that's, that's 1800 dollars to win 1800 dollars to win 200 dollars to start that's huge but 
we've got something even bigger. This is my favorite part. I just learned about this today when I came over here. So this is, we've got on Thursday, September 18th, it says TBA on the schedule, but I'm going to eliminate that TBA right now. I'm going to let Mark Dilly tell you what the TBA is. So you'll be able to mark your calendars September 18th. Don't go to work. Don't go, I don't know, school, school's probably started. Then. Don't go to school. You don't need school. Come September 18th. What's going on at Sunset Speedway on Thursday, September 18th? Well, I'm just going to touch base. I've got a couple things that are going to happen. Uh, first of all, on May 10th, we're going to have a big pro Late model show. We're going to pay 5000 to win there. That's, uh, you know, I'll have everything together on that shortly. That's going to be a big event. I'm excited about that. I talked to, you know, John at Flamborough's worked with me. The guys at uh, Delaware worked, you know, on that. That's, that's a great deal. I'm excited about that. That's going to be a good one. And uh, I just want to get a touch in, too. I, I appreciate Salvo Falls has sponsored the late model, so you'll see some of our late model compete in that race along with Salvo Falls. All the late models are competed at every Super Series. Coming into the 18th, <laughs> we have uh, in Barry this year, we have the International Plowing Match. So talking with the plowing match people and, and getting, I'm, I was, you know, when, when I seen that was coming, I'm thinking, okay, how can we tie into that, you know, get some exposure for the racetrack, help the plowing match out, and draw people. They have, you know, they have on-site camping. I believe they have two, two or three thousand on-site camping spots. That are, they're all sold out. Everything's sold out and camping for those four days. Talking with them, they don't have anything that operates on Thursday. It closes at four o'clock and that's it. So, you know, I was I was going to run a pro late model race, thinking about that. It didn't work out because of where Delaware and, and Justin that where they were with their great Canadian. Limited, we got 100 laps of the week before, 100 laps of the week after. So I got thinking about it, we got talking, I'm going to run a, a big uh, super late model race. And it, it'll be a big one. Right now, you know, rough numbers on it, we're at about a $27,000 payout. It's going to pay $6,000 to win, roughly $600 to start. Um, and and talked with Dave and John at, at Oscar, and everyone knows it's not going to be all Oscar style. It'll be Oscar style cars, but there'll be 10 foot cars. Um, it, it will be a huge, it's going to be good, I think, for everybody. It's going to be able to showcase Oscar cars to different people that probably wouldn't see them. Um, talking right now with, uh, I talked, I've talked with uh, Johnny Benson and Matt Crafton. Uh, they're very interested in coming. I'll have some more details on that. I'm excited about that because I don't know if anyone's ever seen Johnny Sauter drive a late model, but he is wild. Jo the He's, whole Sauter family, yeah. when they get in the super late model, they are, they are wild. off the chains. They're wild. So I, that'll be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm you know, trying to put it together, too. I mean, to have the Truck Series champion and Matt Crafton come would be huge. So just working on stuff with that. Um, I've had a lot of great feedback from racers around. Jeff Hanley would definitely be there. Um, we've had a, I've, had, I've probably had 20 calls. And I have, this is basically the first we've said anything so Just about, off rumor alone, yeah. 20 phone calls. Yeah, and I've had some guys out of the States. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen, and it will it will be big. We are gonna put a big push to her, and uh, uh, it'll be quite the show. And that, you know, Thursday night we'll get it done and wham it in there, and it's uh, it's gonna be a 75 lapper, is what it is, just to, because that's what they can basically run on the tire part of it. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, and like I said, it's gonna pay six thousand to win. So it's. Uh, that usually drives a few people. It pays you, pretty big all the way through. You'll get some pretty big flats for six thousand dollars to win. And I can tell you right now, off the top of my head, I can't think of another crown jewel event anywhere in North America that runs outlaw bodied super late models straight up against template bodied super late models. There, there right. isn't. There's no other track that does it. That'll be the first time. Definitely the first time in Ontario. Yeah. The real the reality is, I mean, it's, I, I think an outlaw body is probably a little bit of an advantage on the front downforce and, and stuff like that on the side, but. I mean, I think that I think they're going to mesh very well. I don't think that you're going to see huge, huge swings and differences. So I think they'll mesh well. But you know, in saying that, we again we got the super modifieds are back too. Uh, we got some big events. The Biederman's back. Um, September, as I'm looking here, I mean, hundred lap championship night, late model fifty superstar. We got the super late model race, Velocity weekend. We got. To, <laughs> It's gotta be busy. You got a little bit going on now. Yeah. I know you, you you just wrapped up uh, the the first wave of driver registrations. How are the numbers looking for 2014? I mean, there, you just gave us a litany of reasons to be excited, but uh, drop another one on me. Car count, driver count. But what what's the interest looking like for the shortened schedule? I mean, what are we looking at heading into the heading into the it's, season for when we open the door on May third? Uh, it's um, 
it's the best we've ever had. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, that's the truth. I mean, we have, uh, and these are paid, registered cars. We have, uh, when I walked out of there, we had 40 mini stocks. Uh, there was 39 paid and registered when I was there. There was another guy going up the, the thing, so that makes 40. Uh, 18 super stocks, and I know of two that aren't registered yet that are registering. And we're at 32 uh, late models. And I know that there's three guys that I know of that haven't registered, and there's some other guys that I don't know of that I heard are talking about coming. So, you know, numbers are strong. We had over 90 cars uh, re paid, registered. Uh, Going to have to put more pads in. I know that right out of the bucket. That's that's pretty well given. There's been pads paid for. So when people make a commitment of a pad and, and register in a three, whatever it is, $300 or $350 a time, that's a bit of a commitment. So chances are those people are coming at one point or another. Um, very happy. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm excited. A lot of people are excited about what we've done with the schedule, getting some family time, and you know they they just uh, it's it's different. I mean the pressures of life. Like I said, the pressures of life that people can do some other stuff. So there you go, folks. I mean, 2014 season of sunset's going to be a big one. I got a lot of we got a lot of insight into into Mark's past. I mean, I I could go for another hour. So this is definitely not going to be the last time we have uh, we have Mark on the program. We'll get him back again. Mark, thank you so much for the time. Thanks for providing the digs here. It's a nice little backdrop we got here. Make sure you come out to Sunset Speedway this year. www.sunsetspeedway.ca. So the schedule will be up soon, I'm assuming. Yeah, and if you know, drop by the booth at the CME show. We'll be there. You know, come in and see us. We'll have some stuff, schedules, all kinds, and I'll have some some pretty good. Uh, I have some more announcements there. Let's just say that. There you have it. That's February 7th, 8th, and 9th at the International Center in Toronto. For Mark Dilley, I'm Spencer Lewis. We're done with bench racing. Just watch to see who we've got next because it's going to be someone, you know, just as cool as Mark Dilley. Just watch. So thanks for watching. Make sure to come back and check out that again.